ریڈیو زندگی الیون سیونٹی اے ایم پہ ویلکم لسنر میں ہوں آپ کے ساتھ ایرا شو لے کے آئے ہیں دا شاہ پیر علی لا شو براٹ یو بائی شاہ پیر علی لا گروپ یس اٹ ٹائم ونس اگین وین وی آر جوائن بائی اٹارنی شاہ پیر علی آن ایئر ود اس ہی از دا فاؤنڈر پریزیڈنٹ اینڈ مینیجنگ اٹارنی آف دا شاہ پیر علی لا گروپ وچ از بیسڈ رائٹ ہیئر ان نیو ورک کیلیفورنیا ہی از ممبر آف دا امیریکن امیگریشن لائرس ایسوسی ایشن ایز ویل ایز دا اسٹیٹ بار آف کیلیفورنیا ہی از پیشنیٹ ایڈوکیٹ آف ہیومن رائٹس سول رائٹس سوشل ایکشن اینڈ سوشل سروسز اینڈ ہی ہیز اے اسٹرانگ انٹرسٹ ان اینڈ نالج آف دا پولیٹیکل لیگل سسٹم ان دا یو ایس He formed his law group to work on the causes he feels most ardent about. The law group focuses on immigration law with an emphasis on employment-based immigration and therefore they also help their clients all over the U.S. Offices are in Newark, San Francisco and Washington, D.C. So listeners, if you'd like to speak to Attorney Shapir Ali, you can call us during the show which is now on the studio number 510-657-1170. That's 510-657-1170. You can also get in touch with them on their office number 510-742-5887. Make an appointment to speak with them and uh, you will get all this information and more on the website puralilaw.com. Good morning, Attorney Shah Pirali. Welcome to the show. How are you? Good morning, Ara. Good morning. Uh, I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay like everybody else. But, uh, <laughs> We are so far so good <laughs> and I hope you're doing well and the listeners are doing well too. Well, we hope so. Yes, I, I am doing well. Thank you for asking and I hope the listeners are doing well as well. Let's get started. What are we talking about today? Well, we're going to talk about different things and, uh, as usual, but we also, we're also we going to focus a little bit on employment base. We'll have Sharif joining us. And before I start, of course, Ira, anything I'm going to tell you today is my opinion and Sharif's opinion. Uh, we uh, You have uh, basically... Okay, I'm losing my track. Uh, it's my opinion. You should not act or refrain to act solely uh, on, on the information provided. You should contact an attorney if you have any questions. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you so much for listening. Last week, I couldn't do the show live, so it was a recorded show. And uh, I, I hope uh, a lot of things has happened. But then uh, a lot of good things and bad things and in the between, um, so many other things happening. So we're going to cover a little bit few of them for uh, one um yeah go ahead we have two callers who are waiting to speak to you so do you want to take those calls okay. right away let me take yeah let me take the callers right away okay let's do that uh, good morning you're on air with attorney shah pirali hey uh yes sir. good morning mr shah yes good morning how are you can you hear me i'm good how are you i'm doing well please uh, tell yes. me what go ahead yeah so i have a question regarding h1b and h4 Mm-hmm. So I was with employer A first, and then when I was moving to employer B, uh, they filed for my I-797. And uh, during that filing, like, you know, my filing got approved and everything was fine. During the filing, they told me, like, you know, my wife's H-4 is valid until August 2021. Mm-hmm. So I don't need to renew her H-4. Immediately, I can renew before August 2021. Right. Mm. Okay. So now, at this June 2021, we are traveling to India. So mm. we both of us have to go and get our stamping done. So at the okay. U.S. consulate, if I go with my current employer, new employer, I-797, and then she is coming with me with her uh, I-797, that is from my previous employer, would there be an issue or... Mm. Okay. Let me answer because this is a very interesting question. There are two parts in your question that I need to answer. Number one, what the lawyer told you is not really true. You are supposed, whenever you transfer the case, to file another H4. H4. The reason for that is an H4 is always attached to an H1. When you leave a company, they cancel the H1. The H4 is broken. It no longer is valid. That means you are technically supposed to have filed an I-539. Now, the second part is that the fact that you're traveling, you don't really need a 797 to go for stamping. So, H4 doesn't work like an H1. You don't have to get an approval here to go and get it there. So, as long as your H1 is good, when she mm-hmm. goes for stamping, she will be fine, even if she doesn't have a 797. So, there are two things there. Uh, for one, 
hopefully they have not cancelled your H1B prior to that because that will put her out of status and it can cause some issues. Um, but if they have not cancelled the previous H1, then her H4 is still good. And um, second, you don't need that 797 at all to get the stamp. You just need your H1B, your marriage certificate, and that's it. Okay, so and assume the form uh, um, they cancel my H1B, so she's currently out of status. That's what you mean? If they did, yeah. Technically, yes. Yeah. Because yeah, a lot so of ca- uh, lawyers make that mistakes, and... And they argue and argue, but that's not the that's not the rule. I had people arguing with me too, but the rule I have seen cases where people go out of status without even knowing because of this specific reason. So that's why whenever you do an H1 transfer, mm-hmm. you always have to do an H4. Even the H4 is not expired, you have to file the H4. Okay, so now okay. she can still travel, right? Even though she's out of status, she can travel. Yeah, yeah and she, she should be. Yeah, she should be able to travel, but the question is that when did you do your transfer? Last year. When did you lose? Last year or when? Do you have a time? Uh, in fact, I'm mean, like, we are in 2021, so the transfer was done in 2019, July. Mm, okay. Well, hopefully they have not cancelled it, then she has not accrued any unlawful presence, but... In case she did, give me a call at the office. Uh, maybe we can talk uh, before you go, and we ca- I can get more information. I cannot ask you on the radio about that, but five one zero seven four two five eight eight seven. We can do a consultation. But until then, yeah, if she goes and there's no problem in that previous H one, uh, the H four is still good, so you should be fine for her. Okay. Okay. Good. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for Good calling in. The office number once again is 510-742-5887. Let's speak to our next caller. Hello, you're on air with Attorney Shapir Ali. Yeah, hi. Good morning. Hi. Please go ahead. Good morning. The question is that I, have a I can't hear you. Your so voice is breaking. Could you say that again? Yeah. Can you hear me now? You know, every time you speak, your voice is it clips. What about now? Yeah. Could you call me back? Could you just call us back on the same number? Maybe it's better this time, okay? Yeah, thank you, thank yeah, I you. Think it, I yeah. think it's the internet phone that Probably. sometimes it does that when they use an internet number. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so anybody next or we can continue? Uh, uh, I just wanted to make yeah. some... Please go, go ahead. ahead. No, 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 you, please go ahead. I, yeah. I think this caller is... So just to, go back, just to go back to that previous caller because mm-hmm. the question he asked got major. Uh, it's too fast, that, like I was... That caller is back. Yeah, so he's back. Yeah. Hello, okay. you're uh-huh. on, hello, you're on air? Hello? Yeah, you should be able to hear me now. Yes, we can. Thank you. Please yeah, go ahead. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. So yeah. my question is that I, I'd like to bring my parents over here in California and I'm currently on a on a green card status. The thing is that they have recently switched their citizenship to Italian citizenship, so they can only apply for the ESTA, which allows them to stay uh, in the U.S. just for 90 days. Mm-hmm. Is there any way that they can manage to stay here with me for for longer periods, such as six months? No, but the ESTA doesn't force them to go for the B1, uh, for the visitor visa. The problem is that because of the COVID, they might not get a chance to go and get it. But no, mm-hmm. the the ESTA problem is just some, I'm hoping that Biden will remove some of the rules that Trump put, but um, you could choose. You could also get a, visa, a B1 visa, for example, for them. The, B1 the only thing that I'm scared about that is that uh, they mentioned that if they refuse your visitor visa, then you cannot even apply for ESTA anymore. So there would be no chance for them to come come and live with me for a longer exactly. period. Exactly. That's the problem. Yeah. But people from Europe, most of the time, they don't deny the B1, B2. Because the mm-hmm. if they come here, there's no way to extend it. It's not possible. Unless yes. you become a citizen and maybe they file for a green card or something like that. Even that, there are issues with INA 214B. So, um, unfortunately, no, you will have to take that risk or let them come and then see how things work out because otherwise you're going to be... A, I don't see any other option for them to visit. That's the only one. Okay. The, the only risk is that since they uh, they were they had an, an Indian citizenship before and now moved to Italian, 
there might be a case that the B1 could be refused, but yeah. Exactly, it's true. There's a chance of that, unfortunately. You're right mm -hmm. on that, but uh, there's no real solution I can give you immediately unless you just let them come and then hopefully, when are you going to be a citizen? Uh, it's going to take about three, four years. Okay, okay, yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. you know, it's better to take that star, let them leave, and then maybe a few months later come back and visit you. But don't uh, try to take any risk on anything. Plus, with the COVID, everything is kind of a little bit messed up, okay? Yes, yes, yes. What, what do you mean by coming them? It's just come, making them come here on ESTA, and then they leave, and then they can come again. And they leave, and then the they come back like a few months later, yeah. Just, that, yes. that would be better, because... Or, or you can, like I said, you can always go for the B1, B2, but your, your worried is justified because the, the citizenship is Qatari and you never know how they're going to react. Yeah, okay? yeah I don't want to take that chance because eventually I have a stable job mm -hmm. here. My wife's, my wife's living here and, and working and uh, we want them to be here with us. If the visitor gets refused, then it just creates more problems. Yeah, so you're better off just let them come for this three months. And then mm -hmm. make them leave, and maybe they can come back a little bit later, another three months. Okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Good luck to you. Good luck. Thank Bye you now. very much for calling in. We have one more caller. Uh, let's take this call and see what they'd like to ask you. Hello, you're on air with Attorney Shapir Ali. Yes. Uh, hi, Attorney. So I have one question regarding 485 pending status as of March. Yes, sir. go ahead. Bulletin. And I'm um, current uh, as of March bulletin, and my priority date month is in 2012. I go, I'm on EAD. Mm -hmm. And uh, till now, uh, after applying my uh, EAD R485 in 2012, I haven't got any update. Mm -hmm. As of the March month, I'm current. So is it normal or what? Uh, what is that? Uh, regarding this, because I haven't got any update. Uh, I've been moving in different places. I appreciate it. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's everybody's going to this. Uh, now they're starting issuing. Some people, now they're getting the receipt, in fact. So it's it's unfortunate, but that's that's the way things are going now, right now. You just have to... Uh, you got your receipt already, right? And you filed in yes, October. Um, when did you file your... You filed in October? Uh, no. Uh, my, I have filed... Uh, I got my EAD in 2012, February itself. Mm hmm. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Hold on a second. So let me get the question right. I thought you were talking about the EAD. So you have your EAD, and your priority date is EB2, EB3. EB2. Uh, as of last month, it is current. Okay, but 2009 uh, December EB2. is my priority date. Uh, 2009 is your priority date. I heard 2012. Correct. I'm so sorry. I'm. I think I'm having. I'm not hearing properly, so I apologize for that. Yeah, if the dates are current, ultimately, did you already do the interview? Did they call you for an interview? I haven't any, I haven't got any communication from UCS from the past uh, ten uh, nine years. I just applied. I have been renewing my EADs. I'm on EAD. Okay. Okay. Did you apply on your own, or you applied to an attorney? I have been applying through my company's attorneys. And uh, I recently, okay. in four months back, I have applied even uh, 485J. But again, I okay. have changed my employer recently in the last one or two months. So I haven't applied my oh, okay. uh, right now. So you did you did an AC21 portability. So what you need to do, the, the, the company attorney, what they should do, or you can do that yourself, do an inquiry what's happening on your case, and you should get a new medical. A request for a new medical because the medical probably expired and then once you get that the case should be clear but you can request and find out what is going on do a service request you can do that yourself because then i-485 belongs to you or you can have the attorney do it for you and uh, ultimately the attorney who is on file okay and ultimately if um, if things are still delayed, there's no reason you can contact a congressman and get it moving. Because if it is 2009, uh, you say, what date, 2009? December, you said? Yeah, December, uh, December, uh, first week. Oh, okay, okay. So right now they're processing your EB2, right? So you're, they're Correct. processing January 2010. 
So you just do just do an inquiry and find out. Ask the lawyer to do an inquiry because they might send you ASAP because everything is delayed right now. They should send you a request for new medical because the medical is probably expired by now. Um, do you remember when you did the last medical? It is in 2012 when I got my applied, my EAD. Oh, okay, okay. So, yeah, they will need a new, new, definitely a new medical. But what I would recommend, do a service request and... Um, Within the next six months, you should hear from them. But just do a service request to make sure that they got all the information right because a lot of confusion has been going on during the time of Trump and they're still trying to fix it, okay? Okay, sure. And uh, is it necessary to apply for 85J? I already applied with my previous company, but not with the current company because it's been so short you have to. time. You have to. You have to. It's major. You have to ultimately okay. because otherwise... If you get the green card before you apply that, technically you're supposed to go back work for the previous company. So do the supplement J A S A P. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for calling in. Uh, you see, everybody has their own questions. All situations and all uh, you know, cases are different. Listeners, if you would also like to speak to Attorney Shapiri, you can call us right now on the studio number 510-657-1170. That's 510-657-1170. Or if you would like to speak to Attorney Shapiri after the show, or have a private discussion, you can call him directly on the office number 510-742-5887, 510-742-5887, and make an appointment. Log on to the website for more information, PiraliLaw.com. That's P-E-E-R-A-L-L-Y-L-A-W.com. Yes, it's Anisha. Let's, let's continue. Yes, um, indeed. We have very, very interesting questions today because a lot of cases people are or kind of a little bit upset because they're delayed. But remember, we are going through a nightmare right now with the pandemic. And plus, we had another nightmare with Trump. So when you pile all this together, things are not going to be smooth. Don't expect things to be smooth. They are trying their best to fix. So just bear with us. And I have cases where even the post office are messing up with us. I don't know if you have noticed that. So it is. we are really in times that... I've been in America for almost 30 years, maybe now, so I've never seen this kind of stuff, and I don't think anybody's seen that. And mm -hmm. the pandemic, most of our generation has not even witnessed that, unless people who live for 100 years, you know, uh, what we are seeing right now is is out of a sci-fi movie. So we got to really kind of be patient. But at the same time, if cases are getting delayed, you should not sit down on them. You should make make an, an effort because I had cases where people, they don't check and then finally they see an RFU was issued and, with a, and they have not answered it. And since they didn't answer it, ultimately the case was denied. So those are things that you have to really, really make sure you, you cover and talk to your attorney or talk to a, to another attorney who can give you a second opinion. You can call us, uh, 510-7425-887. And sometimes on the radio, certain questions I cannot answer because I need to ask private questions. So the best is to do a personal consultation. So now, going back now to the situation right now, we know we are in the H1B season. They have started accepting already the the applications for the for the what we call the lottery so you should uh, be able to do that and also to let people know that we are in the fiscal uh, fiscal year 2022 okay uh, not 2021 because some people told me oh they stopped taking them no it's not it's 2022 it's not that that what you're seeing on the USCIS so um, now the other thing that I, I wanted people to know is is um, there are things that that we are seeing right now are going on with immigration that are, are a little bit tricky because a lot of people keep hoping that Biden will come up with this one solution and fix everything. It's not. We said that before. It's not. It doesn't work this way. Um, people should not um, just um, think there will be a magical thing that will happen. He already, honestly, he did already a lot by reversing many, many of those of those. Um, 
stupid uh, stupid things that we have seen under the previous administration. But having said that, a lot of the ghosts, phantoms, or whatever we want to call them, are still there and they're still causing problems. And some people are still kind of thinking Trump is still president. And that's kind of worrisome because people working in the administration and in the government still believe that uh, Trump is a president. That's worrisome because uh, they might not be willing to take orders the way he wants. And then Biden himself seems to be overwhelmed with so many issues happening. But luckily, he is moving fast. Um, a lot of executive orders, a lot of things have been reversed. For example, uh, there was a policy under Trump, if you make one mistake on a form, the form was rejected. Trump, uh, Biden took this away. Uh, there were also the ban on certain countries, he took that away. There's a bunch of stuff, I can list them. And there was another one last week, I, I even forgot uh, what it was, but there was, it was good news, by the way. So. Uh, just bear with us a little bit. It's only you've been one and a half months he's in power, right? So we need to be be a little bit more uh, considerate and understand. We know a lot of people suffered, but reversing everything within one month is going to be impossible. It's not even possible because it will require a lot of logistics, and right now there are a lot of other priorities like vaccination, etc., etc. So don't kind of think something magical is going to come right now it's not and a lot of people are going to get upset but unfortunately there's only so much a government can do we have to be honest with that having said that that doesn't mean I agree everything he's doing because a lot of things are just useless like for example going to war and stuff like that but everybody knew that Biden was a little bit a hawk so, but at the same time, America needs to keep its presence in the world. And look at what has happened to the world when America looked the other way. And we are seeing genocide. We are seeing abuse of, of, of people by their governments. And you name it. And uh, I, it, it's a lot of stuff. Is Sharif there? Yes, he is. Okay, okay. Hey, Sharif, how are you there? How are you going? It's going yes, well. It's going? going well. You look very happy. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the sun is shining. We have some nice weather finally, so that's, that's good. Uh, here Very in the good, East Coast, we had a pretty cold February, but it's really, really nice today. Good, good, good. Tell us what's going on with you in the capital. So, any other riots sure. coming? What's okay. going on? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, those things will come and go, but that's I think nowadays dog. they're... they're yeah, I think nowadays no, they're they said tomorrow there will be one. Yeah, it looks like That's tomorrow there's, there's going to be some action, but ultimately I think that they'll control it, but, you know, there's going to be, there's always been a uh, kind of strain of kind of extremism, so, you know, that's going to continue, and, um, you know, maybe when they get the stimulus checks, they'll be a little bit more calm. Yeah. A lot of these guys are, Funny po- you know, yeah. you know sp- living speaking of stimulus here. Let me hear that guy who was an illegal immigrant protesting for Trump. Because he was oh, Dutch, he got busted no, there. I, oh, oh, really? Wow. I was going to say that <laughs> uh, a lot of these guys are living in their mother's basements and attics and, you know, 40 years yeah. old and just, you know, have nothing. Yeah, and they eat only orga- so. organic food, too. <laughs> 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 and they want organic food, you know. That's what I don't know. How come he gets such a special treatment? He did you? Oh, God, um, I don't want to start on this. <laughs> yeah, t- tell us... Um, Sharif, a little bit what's what's going on because uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about national trust waivers for people who are yeah, working me, for, for other companies. Let me put it in the context, if, if I can. So, you know, sure, a ahead. lot of this, a lot of discussion is taking place, uh, especially in Washington, uh, with regard to a potential for an immigration bill. Of course, we don't know what's going to happen because ultimately, when it comes to an immigration bill. You need 60 votes in the Senate. That means to have 10 Republicans. So there's going to be a lot of um, kind of horse trading and, you know, political maneuvering happening. But let's just be very, very optimistic for one day. And let's say that by some miracle, there will be some relief with the country quota situation for India and China. Under the best circumstance that will uh, probably be put into place 
in a transition time. So it could take up to a year, two years, three years. We don't know. But best case scenario, probably two, three years. In addition to that... Let me be honest. I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think it's going to happen. Let let me just continue the thought one second. I'll tell you where I'm going. So even if it happens, okay, which is uh, unlikely, even if it happens, what's going to take place is you are going to have probably with the families, the children, and spouses, about, you know, millions of people that would be all uh, potentially applying. And that would create such a huge jam in the, in the system. And you're talking about people who are on perm, with, depending on employer sponsor. So if there's any economic turbulence or layoffs or issues that are going to happen in the next two years, you can forget about the green card. Because... It's, you're going to need an I-45 supplement J. If you have PERM, you're going to need, if you and, and you change employers, the new employer is going to need to file a new PERM. And if that new employer, subsequent employer, had layoffs, they're not going to be able to file your PERM. So a lot of people are going to be in a very, very bad situation after waiting all of these years, even if the country quota is there. And I don't think anybody is really thinking about this. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because anybody right now who is sitting in an EB2 perm waiting for their country, you know, quota situation or waiting for their uh, priority date to become current, you need to really understand that you're still in a risk situation. And the way that you can reduce that risk is to file what's called an EB-2 National Interest Waiver. The reason why it's important to file an EB-2 National Interest Waiver is because it will put you in a situation where you're no longer reliant on your employer. You are now relying on yourself. So even if there's layoffs, even if you have to change your job, a lot of people got caught up. Remember when um, a few months ago the date for EB-3 became, you know, uh, advanced and everybody was rushing to do EB3 downgrade and adjustment of status, so many people were caught off guard because they had changed their job and their subsequent employer had not filed a new firm. So you have to understand that you, you don't want to put yourself in a predicament where you are depending solely on your employer sponsorship and you think that the, the sun is always shining, it's shining today, that's for sure. Even here in Washington, D.C., it's shining. But tomorrow, we don't know what the weather is going to be like. It might be a very bad storm. So that's why when it comes to protecting your family, don't trust Congress, don't trust Biden, don't trust anybody. You have to protect your family. You have to do all of the above approach so that you are dealing in a situation or living in a situation where you are protected. I really, really sometimes worry deeply that a lot of people are let going to me, be in a very, me, very bad situation. Let me add one thing here, uh, Sharif, because I'm seeing examples right now. A lot of people have downgraded and filed their cases. And guess what? Some cases are getting rejected because of mistakes. Or, or And, you know, they had that rule, if you don't fill one part, etc. Now Biden took this away. But now guess what? They cannot refile the case because the dates are already backlog again. It went back to 2012, I think. So they put all their all their eggs in that one basket now, and it's it's really going to hurt a lot of people. Unfortunately, I'm already starting to have calls. Not only that, but even even with the modest change that happened with the EB3 dates, the system became so jammed up that it was. Taking a lot of people, they filed their uh, downgrade maybe in November, December, even until now. We're in March. They have not even received a receipt notice. I mean, some people now they have it and some people are getting processed. But I have a strong feeling that the, uh, the, the processing time, the date, all of those things will become much, much worse, um, you know, in, in, in the case that future uh, country quota uh, is is addressed, where you have advancements in priority date, and 
a lot of times the employer, you know, the I-485 Supplement J, especially when we're talking about people who might be working on a consulting basis, those employers are not going to have a big incentive to complete that I-485 Supplement J. And, you know, I've seen that happen over and over again where it has it's time for the employer to sign the I-485 Supplement J, and the ownership or the management of the consulting firm said, you know what, we're not going to do it. Why is it it's not going to help yes. us for this person to get a green card or get an EAD card? Then they're going to ditch us. We're not going to make our percentage anymore. So the reality is that there's a kind of, you know, sometimes you, you uh, have to be a little street smart, too. It's not, it's not always that you have to be, uh, you know, scientific smart, which is good. I mean, I think that's very important, and a lot of important work is happening. But I find over and over again that clients are so caught up in their day-to-day business and uh, job and employer and serving their employers that they are neglecting their own personal interests and family interests. And this is something that, to be honest with you, you know, I, I was thinking about even last night. I was losing sleep because, you know, people have college-age, almost college-age children. People have, you know, a lot of difficult situations and they could be so productive, but they're not taking advantage of all of the options that are there for them. So those who have contacted us and we've been able to protect them through filing a national interest waiver, that is so much better of a situation. Imagine if you have a national interest waiver, you can change your employer and you don't have to worry about the subsequent employer filing the perm. You can, you know, take your H-1B as long as needed. You can um, file your adjustment of status when your date becomes current without the need for an I-45 supplement J or even a job offer. You can, for that matter, be outside of the U.S. and file for an immigrant visa if your date becomes current. So there is so much advantage, I strongly believe, in the I-4, in the um, National Interest Waiver EB-2 that whether you think the Biden bill will eventually pass or not, it's a necessity to protect you and your family. If, you know, uh, you're going to make any investment, you need to invest in protecting your interests, and this is, I think, the number one need right now. I mean, a lot of people have been able to benefit from EB-1A, and, but as the reality is not everybody, but not everybody qualifies. But many, many more people will qualify for national interest labor. And, you know, I strongly, strongly encourage all of our listeners out there, no matter what role you perform, because a lot of people think you need a master's degree for national interest labor. That's not necessarily the case. So no matter what role that you perform, you can at least, Get an uh, have us uh, provide you so that we can determine whether you're eligible or not. Exactly, and Sharif, I don't know if we can hear Sharif properly. This is Attorney Sharif uh, Silmi, who is the attorney in our office in Washington, D.C., and we are talking about national trust waivers. So, and of course, the the reasons why you should go for that, and we have enumerated a lot of them. You know, when the downgrade uh, uh, basically presented itself, everybody thought it was a good idea, even myself, and still it's a good idea to move on to it, but it is it has Sorry, a I, lot I, I, of uh, risks so it's time to take a chance uh, you never know and we are starting to see the downfall of it on many people because the EB3 seems to be okay. going down and down and down retrogress so going back on EB2 is going to be giving you more headache because they have to refile another one and technically you cannot have two labor certification with the same company and national trust waiver becomes a major thing. So tell us a little bit about that because Sharif, a lot of people are interested but they have this this notion that hey, I don't have this and that's what they put on the list, etc, etc. Tell us a little sure. bit about that. Well, I think the first um, thing I would explain regarding a national interest waiver is that you can qualify with a master's degree and you can qualify without a master's degree. Let me explain. So if you have a master's degree, then we turn the analysis to whether 
you, number one, work in an area that is of considered nationally important, so an area of national importance, and that requires substantial merit. So what this means is that there is some future benefit related to your area of work. And this could be technological benefit. It could be, um, for example, data security is definitely a huge national importance area. I can't Hello? hear Attorney Sharif. No, Attorney Sharif, I can't hear you. Uh, I don't know if you're still there. Uh, you know what? I'm going to try and get oh, him guess- back on the show. Maybe there's a connection problem, network issue or something. Uh, listeners, Sharif, let- are you back? No, no, no. He's not back yet. Uh, listeners, if you need to get in touch with Attorney Shapir Ali or Attorney Sharif, you could call right now during the show on the studio number or you could get in touch with them through their office number. Studio ka number is 510-657-1170 and the office number is 510-742-5887. Attorney Shah, you can on. Uh, you take this over. I'll get Adani uh, Sharif back on air with us. Thank you so much, Ara, and we apologize for the... Uh, he's on the phone, and you know how it is uh, far away. So let me... What he was talking about earlier, um, to put it in simple terms, all we are saying is we can't trust the system uh, of depending on your employer all the time for your green card because a lot of people see themselves changing jobs and every time they have to start over. What we are offering here is a national interest waiver or EB1. Both of them are self-petitions. What self-petition means, you don't need an employer involved at all. right? It's a little bit like the Canadian system, but American way, and this is only two options that exist really when it comes to employment base to get a green card without needing needing an employer. And even the investor visa, of course, there's the investor visa of EB-5, but that's a headache in itself. Uh, not everybody have one million dollars. So these are major, uh, the National Trust Waiver and the EB-1, and I'm hoping that I'll get Sharif back uh, on on um, on, on air so that we can talk more, but um, in the meantime, he was talking about exactly that. So, um, Sharif, he was talking about why we, we um, uh, why we, I'm trying to text him, by the way. Uh, uh, so, uh, what, what he's talking about is very interesting, because a lot of people have been really counting on this new bill, and as you saw earlier, there were a lot, on some articles that the bill themselves was the first bill that Biden wanted to pass over the uh, kind of undocumented workers it has a lot of flaws in it. So imagine now the next bill coming for employment base is going to have flaws too. And and all the Republicans are in the minority in both the Senate and the in the House of Representatives, they are still giving a hard time to to the few Democrats because Republicans have the reputation of being feisty, and Rep- De- Democrats have the reputation of basically accepting anything. So we are seeing basically they are still trying trying to create a disbalance. And if Democrats are not aggressive enough, we're going to see those guys taking over again. And that is not good news for us because Republicans right now, who used to be very pro-employment uh, based immigration, etc., are kind of backing off. Well, they have backed off a long time ago. Now it's getting worse. So I think Sharif is back. Sharif, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Sorry, I don't know exactly what okay. happened there, but... Um, <laughs> no problem, no problem. Tell that, us. But go ahead, go ahead, Sharif. I'll let you continue. No. So... So what I, what I wanted to explain is that regarding national interest waiver, you can apply and qualify for a national interest waiver whether... So if you have a master's degree, then it's a very uh, straightforward analysis. There are three main points that you need to cover. The first point that you need to cover is the area of work that you're involved in. Is the area of work that you're involved in uh, of national importance and requiring substantial merit. So what this means is it could be very broadly interpreted, such as economic benefit to the U.S., technological benefit to the U.S. Um, like I've mentioned in our past shows, 
many people have been successful with uh, working in data security, uh, logistics, particularly in light of the coronavirus situation. Um, you know, supply chains has been a huge area of national importance. And then whether you have merit, like whether the job that you're doing uh, requires certain level of education and experience, uh, things of that nature. Now, the analysis in the second requirement turns to whether you are well positioned to advance your field. So here we're looking at the applicant's um, experience and education. Education is um, actually interesting because with a national interest waiver, education is much more um, weighty. It's given more weight and consideration than, for example, in EB1A, where your professional accomplishments are given more weight. But here, your education, your educational background, what you did as a student, actually will be um, good evidence. In, in addition to that, your professional experience is very important, the accomplishments that you have, where you stand uh, now within your company, within your organization, things of that nature. How well are you positioned to advance the area of work that you're involved in? That is what the analysis is requesting. And then the last requirement is a balance test. We want to balance the interest in the U.S. having you here as a professional, as a person who's working, advancing his field, versus the interest that the U.S. has in protecting U.S. citizen workers. So the best way to do this, in my view, is to offer some explanation of job creation. So, for example, you can make the case that, you know, maybe today I'm working um, in a, a company as an employee, but I intend to um, start a business or start a consulting firm or, you know, do something that's going to create jobs. Or, you know, upon approval of my petition, my organization will expand its department and I will be managing or overseeing the, um, you know, creation of some jobs. So cre job creation is a very, very good way to overcome the last requirement of the balance test. So those are the three requirements for one who has a master's degree. If you do not have a master's degree, then before we get into those three requirements, we need to determine a few things. Number one, do you have a bachelor's degree? So at minimum, you should, if you have a bachelor's degree, that will allow you to carry forward. You need then two additional criteria. One of those criteria can be 10 years of professional experience. So just having a bachelor's degree, 10 years of professional experience, and at least one more criteria, such as professional membership in an organization or commanding a high salary or working in a leadership or critical role for an organization or having significant contributions or reviewing and judging the work of others or um, having authorship of published articles. One of those criteria, in addition to having a bachelor's degree and 10 years work experience, will allow you to apply and hopefully qualify for the National Interest Waiver. So those of you who have tuned in or listened to our previous discussion regarding EB1A, you need to understand that a National Interest Waiver is a lower threshold. It is an EB2 category self-petition, whereas an EB1A is a first category employment-based petition. So you have a much easier time meeting the standard of a national interest waiver um, than you do with an EB1A. Like a lot of things, there's a lot of um, kind of mixed messages online. So if you're doing your own research, uh, be careful. Some of it is outdated because there was a change in the law uh, with regard to national interest waiver. And sometimes maybe people are just um, putting forward a kind of template approach that isn't as sophisticated as you might be necessary to meet your uh, particular need. So it's always best to, you know, give us a call and consult with us so that we can point you in the right direction and guide you 
to a circumstance that will, you know, put you in a better position as I was discussing before because, you know, those of you who are in the backlog and depending on an employer, I think we've seen time and time again that, you know, sometimes you can rely upon them to your own detriment. And, you know, it's a it's a cutthroat world and you don't want to, you know, only be relying on that company. Exactly, Sharif. And now uh, I wanted to let people know you. We are in conversation with Attorney Sharif Silmi from the, our Washington D.C. office, and he handles mostly all the EB1, uh, National Interest Waivers, E2 visas, and also uh, L1 visas and O visas. And Sharif, we didn't have a chance last time when we spoke talking about about EB1C um, because a lot of people don't know that they can get directly to EB1C uh, jumping from uh, they don't have to be in an L1 visa so if yeah. you come here in an H1B and you do qualify tell us a little bit quickly about the requirements we have another I think five minutes right uh, I sure. don't know, five six minutes so the main so the main requirement seven minutes yes yeah the main requirement that we think about uh, for an EB1C um, as it relates to being able to kind of jump over the need to go through an L1A, uh, which is uh, a visa for an intercompany transfer for a manager or an executive, is that you, your company already exists and has a strong foothold in the United States. So it's not like a new company. It already has a very strong record. Um, it's, you know, well entrenched. And it's strong enough to sponsor you for, for excuse me, a managerial or executive position. That with that, you don't need to go through an L1. You can, you know, for example, let's say you performed for the same company outside of the U.S. Uh, as a manager or an executive, and at some point, maybe you entered the U.S. on an H-1B or some other visa, but you have an offer for a managerial or executive position with the same company that you were working with prior to entering the U.S., then you can straight away apply under EB1C um, for a green card. And anyone who is outside of the U.S. and you are working for a subsidiary or an affiliate organization um, of a company that has a presence in the United States, it can be a foreign company with a offices in the U.S. or it could be a U.S. company with offices outside of the U.S., then um, you can also look at immigrating to the U.S. through an EB1C without having to go through an L1A first. That's a, that's an interesting part. I, mean, I remember in 2010 we tried that. Nobody was trying it at that time. And it did work, and we had a lot of companies lining up to do that for their candidates. So remember, there are many things that happen out there that people are not familiar with. They always focus on the one which is mainstream, or mainstream, well, I don't know how to call it, mainstream or main road or whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah. But there are ways out there that a lot of people don't know about. People don't know about U visas, people don't know about EB1A uh, national interest waivers, especially O-1 visas, and all those visas um, are really amazing because they bring most of them bring you to a green card. Uh, of course, the O-1, then you have to do EB-1, but they are ignoring them because they already put some kind of obstacle in their head that is not possible for them, right? Exactly. They're, they're, I think the problem is a lot of people go through some of these firms. They offer very cheap, you know, legal fees, you know, for some of these complex petitions. And all they do is they just use a template to gather all the documents from the, um, you know, candidate. And I'm not going to name names, but I think, you know, everybody knows what we're talking about. They just, you upload all your documents into some, you know, software. And then they just put it in order and submit it to the government with the, cookie cutter, um, cover letter, what have you, that doesn't explain any specific things regarding your case. And maybe, you know, whatever percentage get approved and, you know, if they're very, very strong or they have, you know, specific things that the, that are there. And the vast majority will not. And um, that's bad news of not getting approved gets spread out to the public and then people think they have no chance because so-and-so's case did not get approved. How will my case get approved? 
well, so-and-so maybe did not make, make the proper approach to their case because there's a lot of things that you can do that will enhance your own case. Most of the people that come to us, to be frank with you, they are not in a situation where they're ready to apply on the first day. They need us, you know, to work with them for a period of time to put them in a position to be able to qualify, whether it's a national interest waiver, an O1A, uh, uh, EB1C, and EB1A, whatever it is. I mean, we need to work with them to build them up to the point where they will qualify. That is the difference that you're going to get with our kind of service versus, you know, some other um, maybe I would, you know, say paper pusher uh, methodologies. Yeah, this is exactly what's happening, Shari, because um, sometimes I, I, I get uh, clients say, hey, but my, my company lawyer told me when looking at that, it's not going to work. And we hear that so often, and many of the people, after they work with us, get an approval. I hear every single and it's day. not like we're every saying we, we, are, we are doing <laughs> miracles here. It's just we take a different approach, and I like this approach because it's original. Exactly. And the truth with that originality is not something you can copy because every case is different and original. It's true. There's you, no you know, template uh, in our cases, of course. You know, Shaw, what the yeah, uh, go ahead. We have one told minute. me, well, a client told me the other day just to end the call, you know, he said, you know, after his case got approved, his EB1A was approved, he's actually, um, you know, working in uh, kind of CRM software that controls, you know, a different company. And he said, you know, attorney, I went, I'd never told you this, but I went to 12 immigration attorneys before I came to you. And every single one rejected me and told me I have no chance and I'm wasting my money. And then I came to you and you told me it's going to be a very, very uphill battle. It's going to be a lot of hard work, but you do have a good chance. And here I am with an approval, uh, EB1A in my hand. I'm, you know, just completely changed his life. He has, you know, a 19 year old daughter that was, you know, they were worried what was going to happen with her and aging out and everything. And, you know, thank God we were able to, you know, change that person's life like we've done for many, many other people as well. Exactly. So, Sharif, thank you so much. I want to, I really appreciate having you and, and, uh, hopefully we'll have you. Thank in you. Let's we'll do it again more. next week. We have we'll cut off, so maybe we need more, more. Uh, okay, so, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, you're always whenever, welcome. Whenever if you want to come by, you get busy, and I don't know when you're free. So, yeah, next week we can talk a little bit about EB1. That's perfect. So let's All do right. that, and then we can talk about O1. Thank you so much, Sharif. Thank you so much, Thank Ira. you. Thank you. Anything Thank we you. told you today? Thank you. Um, so Sharif is pumped up, so he'll be back next then great <laughs> so anything we told you today is our opinion you should not act or refrain to act solely on the information provided you should contact an attorney if you have any questions 510-742-5887 thank you Adanita. thank Take you very much for being here and listeners there are more testimonials that you can check on the website puralilaw.com that's the website where you can get all this information and more pick up the phone and call 510-742-5887 that's 510 510-742- Devin, send an email to info at puralilaw.com or simply log on to the website puralilaw.com. That's P-E-E-R-A-L-L-Y-L-A-W.com. Stay tuned to Radio Zindagi. We'll be back again here next week. Same time, same place. Cheers.